The first time I asked myself these questions seriously was in 1964, when I'd finished my third year here at Harvard and volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project. And the Mississippi Summer Project was an effort to support the, uh, the work of African American organizers in Mississippi, the most racist state in the country at the time, and um, in, in challenging the barriers of segregation, political rights, and so forth. But organizers in the uh, black organizers in Mississippi found uh, they'd either wind up uh, beaten or in jail or worse. And so the idea was to try to bring people who the law did cover to Mississippi in the hope of bringing the law to Mississippi. And so that's why many of us from the North were recruited to go and join in this effort. And we were in a training session in Oxford, Ohio, about 300 of us in the night before it was time to go. And we got word that three of our party had disappeared, uh, Michael Schwerner, Andy Goodman, and James Cheney. They had gone down a week before, went to Meridian, Mississippi, been sent to Philadelphia, Mississippi to investigate the burning of a black church where civil rights activity had been going on and they hadn't been heard from since. Now, Bob Moses, appropriately named, who was the lead organizer of the whole effort, called us together in an auditorium like this. And uh, he was a soft-spoken guy and he delivered this news. He says that, you know, our three brothers are, are uh, have disappeared. We don't know what happened, but we think we do know what happened. We think they're gone. And sure enough, two months later, their bullet-riddled, beaten bodies were found buried in a dirt levee where the Ku Klux Klan had taken them after the sheriffs turned them over to them. Now, we didn't know that at the time. But Bob said, look, <coughs> I can't take all responsibility for, for this. Uh, I would like to tell you just go home. Forget it. But I need you to go. And so everybody here has got to decide. You decide not to go, that's fine. That's no shame but I need you to go. Well, that's one of those moments that you sink into your seat and it was utter silence in that room. And you begin to think, what the hell am I doing here? Is this what I've, you know, angled for? No. So I began to reflect my own experience. My father was a rabbi. We lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War. And as a child, I met people whose lives had been shattered by the horror of the Holocaust, trying to find hope somewhere. But my parents interpreted it to me as not being simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism and that racism kills. Uh, it's, uh, you turn people into objects, anything can happen. Anything, you can do it, anything. As a rabbi's kid, I don't know if there's any preacher's kids here or whatever, oh, there's one, what kind? Uh, Protestant. What kind of Protestant? Huh? My dad's a pastor. Of what, what denomination? Uh, Episcopal. Episcopal, all right, good, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, we got it. Um, it's a, it's a, you, you have to go to all the stuff. You know, you have to show up at all the things, you know, the services and all that. You're also supposed to be perfect, which is a different set of issues that we're not gonna get into right now. Uh, but I love the Passover seders. I love the telling of the story of the Exodus with food, which was cool. But they would point to the kids and say, you were slaves in Egypt. And I say, excuse me, I've never been to Egypt. I've never been a slave. It took a while for me to figure out that what that meant was that that story is not the property of one people, time, or place but is told generation after generation, and you kind of have to figure out, are you with those guys with the chariots and the horses, or are you with those people who are trying to find their way to a land of promise? The civil rights movement spoke, the, told the same story, literally the same story, about the Exodus struggle in Dr. King's account. And finally, it was a movement of young people looking around the room that I was sitting in. I mean, I was 20 at the time, people were 18, 19, 21. It was a movement of young people. And Walter Brueggemann, the Protestant theologian, wrote a book where he said, prophetic imagination or transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two elements. One he calls criticality, which is a clear vision of the world's hurt, of its need, of its pain, coupled, he says, with hope, a sense of the world's promise and possibility. And young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find in almost of necessity hopeful hearts. And so for many of us, that's what drew us to the civil rights movement. So as we're sitting there in the room, a young woman named Jean Wheeler stood up in the back and she began to say, they say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we struggled so long we must be free. They say that freedom is a constant dying. We've died too long, we must be free. And as she stood up and began to walk out of the room, everyone filed in behind her. And the next day, everyone went to Mississippi. Now that was a life-changing moment for me. 
because encountering Mississippi was to, with all due respect to Harvard, where my education about race, power, and politics began in America. And it was very clear that the inequalities were so clear, uh, but it was also clear that bringing a few medical supplies or books wouldn't change very much. That, that's when we began to learn the difference between charity and justice. Charity says, what's wrong? Let me help. Just says, justice says, why is it happening? Let me change it. And when you begin to ask those questions, you make people uncomfortable because you begin to discover that these people don't have over here enough because these people over here have too much. And so then you are in a struggle. And it's a struggle to figure out how people can turn their resources into the power they need to change things. That's what organizing is about. And the civil rights movement discovered it in the Montgomery bus boycott when people realized that they could use their feet to walk to work instead of getting on the bus. And by doing it long enough for a year, they could turn individual dependency on the bus company into collective power. Now that was a very exciting discovery. I got hooked on it. Instead of coming back to school, um, you know, I actually wrote Harvard a, a letter saying, how can I come back and study history when we're busy making history, which was pretty arrogant, but also, <laughs> but it was also true. Uh, and so I, I went back to California where I grew up. Uh, I'd grown up in the middle of the farm worker world, never seen it. Cesar Chavez had just started a grape strike of migrant farm workers. It turned out that there was another community of people of color, also without political rights, also without economic protections, and California with its own rich history of racial uh, discrimination beginning with the native peoples, with the Chinese, the Japanese, and so forth. So it turned out that Mississippi was not an exception to America, but an example of America, and the example, I mean, an example of the America we needed to change. So I began to work with Caesar, did that for the next 16 years, where I learned the craft of organizing, another 10 years, union issue and electoral work, was then invited to my 25th reunion here at Harvard. I'd never come to a reunion. For some reason, I came to that reunion, ran into a 20-year-old version of me, said how it's going, asked me. I said, I'm feeling stuck. 20-year-old me said, come back and finish that senior year. I said, my synopsis may not work. Uh, I talked to one of the deans. We dealt with the fact that tuition had changed a little bit in the intervening period. And so, and so in 1991, it came back, finished my senior year in history government, wrote a senior thesis, graduated class 64-92. Uh, and, and my 81-year-old mother got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate, uh, which was an important loop to close. Then the Kennedy School for a master's and then a PhD in sociology. So I've been on the faculty here at the Kennedy School full time since 2000. And I was asked to teach a course on organizing, which turned out to be critical because it was a way for me to integrate my life experience with social science in a pedagogical conversation with a rising generation. So for me, it was like twice a week, you get to go and have a conversation with the future. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. And so it's a mutual kind of learning experience. And then through my students was, was called back into the world of action, beginning with Howard Dean's campaign in 2003, uh, the work with the Sierra Club after that, and then the Obama campaign 2007, uh, and so forth. So where this whole approach to, this is where this whole approach to public narrative comes from. In other words, it comes from experience, it comes from social science, most of all, it comes from practice. And it is a way of engaging practice thoughtfully and purposefully. So let's get right into public narrative uh, and how it works. <clears throat> 